<laughs> Back again. Here we are. Yes. Another day. In the so uh, earlier, like I said, uh, you had some interviews. So it was taken. That was Mike Holgren. Yeah, I thought you were coming in play. Well, we're not going to change it. It's getting more complicated. Which I've never understood. Why they? Well, I mean, I guess they're pretty. I got guys upstairs watching. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. 
Two minute warning to briefing, two minute warning.
Thank you. Okay. I have a couple of items for all of you at the top. Um, uh, first, let me say it's great to be back with all of you. Although, as a longtime hater of heels, I do miss my slippers, so which I'm sure some of the women in this room can agree with. Um, but just to reiterate, um, I had intended to go on the trip with the president um, about two weeks ago. I did not go on the trip because I had members of my household who had tested positive for COVID. So out of an abundance of caution, I stayed home. I received four negative tests. And then on October 31st, I received a positive test. And I put out that information uh, out of an abundance of transparency. I had not seen the president or had close contact for five days, given the trip. And when I did see him five days prior, we wore masks and we were uh, sitting outside. Uh, as I noted in my initial statement, um, and was still the case even after that, I had mild symptoms, uh, primarily fatigue, um, and I remain uh, incredibly grateful for the vaccine um, and the impact of the vaccine in keeping me safe and uh, other people in my uh, house safe as well. Um, I also noted in my initial statement that I would be uh, abiding by a 10-day quarantine, which for the math, it started uh, on November 1st, which was the day after I received a positive test. It ended on Wednesday, November 10th, and then yesterday, per White House protocols, I had a negative test, and uh, hence, I am here back with all of you today. So I just wanted to outline that at the top. I have a couple of other things. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, we've obviously had a very busy week as it relates to uh, fighting COVID. Um, our vaccination program for kids ages 5 to 11 hit full strength this week. Vaccines for kids are now available in tw at 20,000 trusted and convenient locations. Our rollout is helping parents turn months of anxiety into action. On Wednesday, we estimated that nearly a million kids have already received their first shot and 700,000 additional appointments are already scheduled through pharmacies alone. That doesn't obviously track everybody, but that's still a significant progress. And we anticipate many Many more will be getting vaccinated in the weeks to come. Uh, the First Lady visited a children's vaccination site this week in Virginia and is headed to Texas next week to visit another site to help uh, communicate with families, with parents about the safety and the efficacy of these vaccines. I also wanted to give an update on the success of vaccine requirements. New data show that as vaccination requirements expanded, our vaccination rate also increased. In the past week, we're averaging nearly 300,000 first shots for people ages 12 and older per day. These are new people getting vaccinated. For comparison, in mid-July, before the pandemic began, in, before the president began implementing vaccine requirements, we were averaging less than 250,000 per shot per day. It's clear that these requirements, driven by the president's leadership, are getting more people vaccinated, accelerating our path out of the pandemic, saving more lives. Uh, the vaccine requirements we put forward are going to continue to accelerate our path out of the pandemic. That's how we see our our path forward. Um, I'd also note that uh, we're encouraged by the progress companies like JetBlue are making as they implement their own vaccine requirement. Here we're firmly in the camp of accelerating our path forward as we have conveyed. Um, also wanted to note that over 27 million Americans have now gotten their booster. Uh, and on testing, this week we invested an additional $650 million in rescue plan funding to help point of care diagnostic test manufacturers scale up their production. It builds on aggressive actions we've taken over the past several months, including to quadruple the supply of at home tests to over 200 million per month starting December. I know I ordered some from Walmart myself. They came the next day and I used them at home. Um, finally, uh, on ensuring equity throughout our response, uh, the President's COVID Health Equity Task Force submitted its recommendations to help us build on this progress. Already, we've announced $785 million investment in rescue plan funding to support community-based organizations that are continuing to build vaccine confidence across communities of color, rural areas, and low-income populations. Finally, I would note 99% of schools are open for in-person learning, and we're helping parents get their kids vaccinated, which means now 95% of people in this country are eligible to be vaccinated. Finally, a week ahead, uh, on Monday, the President and the First Lady will participate in a Tribal Nations Summit, coinciding with National Native American Heritage Month. This will be the first summit since 2016, and the first time that this summit has been hosted at the White House. The President will address tribal leaders and announce a number of steps to improve public safety and justice for Native Americans. Uh, and um, 
and protect pi private lands, treaty rights, and sacred places. The Vice President will be speaking at the summit on Tuesday, and members of the Cabinet will be joining to discuss dozens of agency-specific policy deliverables. Uh, also on Monday, the President will host, as you know, a bipartisan bill signing ceremony for his bipartisan infrastructure deal, where he will be joined by members of Congress who helped write the historic bill, and a diverse group of leaders who fought for its passage, governors and mayors of both parties and labor and business leaders. Also on Monday, very busy day, have your coffee and spinach or whatever whatever your uh, whatever you like for breakfast. Um, the, on Monday evening, the President will meet virtually with President Xi Jinping of the People's Republic of China. The two leaders will discuss ways to responsibly manage the competition between the United States and the PRC, as well as ways to work together where our interests align. Uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday, the President will continue traveling across the country to highlight how his bipartisan infrastructure deal delivers for the American people. So on Tuesday, he's going to be visit, uh, visiting uh, the uh, New Hampshire 175 five bridge over the Pemigewasset, I see how I did that, um, river in Woodstock, New Hampshire, which has been on the state's red list of bridges in poor condition since 2013. There he will discuss how the infrastructure deal will repair and rebuild our nation's roads and bridges while strengthening resilience to climate change. On Wednesday, he will travel to Detroit to visit GM's factory zero electric vehicle assembly plant. He will highlight how his infrastructure plan will build electric vehicle charging stations across the country, making it easier to drive an electric vehicle and also investing in a huge clean energy industry that will put many people back to work. In both Michigan and New Hampshire, he will underscore the bipartisan infrastructure deal will create good paying union jobs. On Thursday, the President will host Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of Canada and Prime Minister uh, uh, Obrador of Mexico for the first uh, North American Leaders Summit since 2016. He will participate in individual bilateral meetings with each leader ahead of the summit that day as well. And last but certainly not least, on Friday, he will pardon the national Thanksgiving turkey, Whoa. continuing the transition uh, in a ceremony in the Rose Garden. This is the 74th anniversary of the national Thanksgiving turkey presentation. We're all very excited to meet the soon-to-be-famous turkey and its alternate. Did you all know there's always an alternate? Okay. Two lives are actually, two turkey lives are actually saved, uh, which were raised in Jennifer, Indiana. Uh, with that, Zeke. Thanks, Jen, uh, and welcome back. Uh, Thank on, you. On the health and uh, COVID uh, subject, uh, could you speak a little bit about how frequently the president is tested uh, for COVID-19 right now, and then also, um, has, when does he plan to undergo his annual physical? Uh, he will be doing his physical soon. As I've noted before, as soon as he does that, we will provide that information transparently to all of you. Uh, he is regularly texted um, under the guidance of his doctor. Uh, we do provide that information regularly to all of you. I'm happy to check and see when the last time he was tested and provide that to you after the briefing as well. Thanks. And, and does the White House have any uh, reaction to the sentencing of American General Danny Fenster uh, in the MR? Um, and any uh, interaction from the White House, reference on the part of the White House to try to get him free? Uh, I will say that obviously we are always concerned about the detention of individuals around the world, uh, journalists, uh, dissidents, uh, people who are speaking freely and uh, speaking on behalf of the media as well. Um, in terms of direct action, I, it really would be under the purview at this point of the State Department. I would point you to them for any updates on, on the status or engagement that they have with the officials there. And uh, lastly, uh, after this morning's APEC meeting, there was no resolution on who uh, the U.S. bid to host in 2023. Can you confirm that Russia is uh, not is the, is the obstacle to that U.S. hosting uh, hosting that summit in a couple of years? And then on the topic of Russia, um, there have been a number of reports in the last couple of days about concerns on the U.S. government over a potential Russian invasion of Ukraine, the, the troop buildup over there. Um, has the president reached out to uh, President Putin? Has, what's the level of engagement right now between the White House and Moscow? Sure. Let me start with your first question. Um, uh, APEC hosting requires uh, the consensus of all 21 economies. Uh, we thank the vast majority of members for their strong support so far. One economy, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to confirm which economy that is, uh, but is still undergoing uh, consultations and has not yet joined the consensus. And our hope is certainly that uh, we move past this impasse that is resolved uh, and that we can continue the positive momentum on economic cooperation uh, through APEC. Um, and then in terms of your second question, say it one more time, I apologize. Yeah, regarding the Russian troop buildup uh, and Ukraine concerns in the, in the U.S. government about potential invasion over there and any White House to Moscow engagement in the last couple of days regarding that buildup. 
Well, um, in recent weeks and certainly days, we've had uh, extensive interactions with our European allies and partners, uh, including with Ukraine, but about our concern about uh, these reports. Uh, and during these meetings, we've, of course, been discussing our concerns about the Russian military activities and their harsh rhetoric toward Ukraine. Uh, we've also held discussions with Russian officials about Ukraine and U.S.-Russian uh, relations generally, um, as we've made clear in the past, and we've made clear directly to them as well, escalatory or aggressive actions by Russia would be of great concern to the United States. Uh, we call for an immediate restoration of the July 2020 ceasefire, and we stand with our partner Ukraine and condemn Russian aggression against Ukraine in all forms. And obviously, our European uh, conversations are about shared concern about the reports of this buildup and rhetoric. Go ahead, Andrea. Hey, so welcome back. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Jen. Um, I wanted to ask you about the uh, the um, uh, Chi meeting that's coming up sure. on Monday. So, are you expecting anything sort of concrete to come out of it, or is this really more about re-establishing a uh, kind of a, a, a better basis for dialogue? Sure. Well, let me. I, I think this is why you're asking me the question. So, let me just go back just briefly of kind of what our strategy has been to date. I mean, this meeting is coming after 10 months of President Biden taking action so we can outcompete China in the long term. And that means investing in ourselves at home to strengthen our own competitive hand. It means working with our partners and allies to make sure we have a united approach and a coordinated approach um, as it relates to engagement with China. Uh, we, of course, believe in intense competition. Uh, in, it, we, we believe and understand intense competition is part of uh, that relationship. We also believe that uh, that uh, requires intense diplomacy. So this is a reflection of that. And if you go back to the President's phone call on September 9th, uh, where this was discussed, and obviously there was follow-up uh, engagement, uh, one of the dis part of the discussion was about the importance of that leader-to-leader -leader engagement, not because um, we are seeking and we're not specific deliverables or outcomes. Um, uh, more because this is about setting the terms, in our view, of uh, an effective competition where we're in a position to defend our values, which certainly will be part of the President's conversation uh, and those of our allies and partners, and also discuss uh, areas where we can work together. So I would see this, Andrea, as more of a uh, continuation of that intensive diplomacy, uh, given, uh, given that we believe intense competition requires that. Uh, and I wouldn't see this as an – I wouldn't set the expectation, I should say, that this is uh, intense to have, uh, you know, deliver major deliverables or outcomes. Yeah, so there were reports that President Xi could ask the President to attend the Olympics in February. What kind of signal would it send if the President were to attend the Olympics, given the concerns that have been raised about China's uh, actions toward Taiwan, its, you know, increased aggression to kind of flights there in that region? Is that, is that, would that be a problematic situation for the President? Well, I understand why, but we're getting a few steps ahead of where we are. I will also note for all of your planning purposes, and don't want to ruin your Sundays, but there will be a preview call uh, of the summit on Sunday that all of you will be invited to. So in terms of the uh, Olympics or any invitation, uh, I don't have anything for you on that at this point. Okay, just a quick one on the economy, on inflation. So one in four Americans, according to a new survey, have experienced some kind of loss of income as a result of higher prices. The president has expressed concern about this. I, I know that you are working on different fronts on to, to address this. But I mean, how urgent is it, and how you know, what, is there any sort of specific um, concern that this is is going to affect not just political outcomes, but just the overall economy? Sure. Well. Andrea, first let me say that, you know, a lot of the talk about inflation, I'm not saying from you, but in general out there, has been, uh, it's become a political cudgel. And it shouldn't be. Uh, it's impacting, as you said, um, millions of Americans, uh, no matter their political party. Um, and that's certainly of concern to the President. Um, I would note that everyone from the Federal Reserve to Wall Street agree with our assessment that inflation is already expected to be subst to substantially decelerate next year. I know you're not talking about that, but that's an important component here. And economists across the board also agree that the President's economic agenda the bipartisan infrastructure bill that he will sign on Monday uh, and the Build Back Better uh, bill that we are working to uh, to move forward will not add to inflationary pressure and will ease inflationary pressure over the long term. But when we move past the economic jargon, which I realize is what you're asking me, um, and talk about the real impacts on people's lives, we're really talking about 
cost to people, right? And you talked about this on Wednesday. So it's cost of childcare, cost of housing, uh, you know, cost of gas, cost of household goods. Uh, that's how people are, are experiencing this on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is, of course, of concern uh, to the president. Our view is that the real risk here is inaction. And the reason we uh, I wanted to do this slide today. One, I love slides and graphics. So on my first day back, we had to have one. But, um, but is because if we don't act on Build Back Better, what we're doing is we are, won't be able to cut child care costs in 2020. We know that is a huge impact on people's daily lives and American families. We won't be able to make preschool free for many families starting in 2022, saving many families $8,600. We won't be able to get ahead of skyrocketing housing costs. I mean, that's a part of this bill, too. Has a major investment in uh, building new housing uh, l uh, affordable housing uh, units so that people can uh, can move into them and live in them and address the, the pending housing crisis. And we won't be able to save American Americans thousands of dollars by negotiating prescription drug prices. So our view is this, this makes a strong case. This is a strong case for moving forward with this agenda because what we're really talking about is cost to American families, how it's impacting them. And that's something that if we don't act now, uh, we won't be able to address these things in the short term either. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Jen, and welcome back. Uh, the president has picked Dr. Rob Califf as his pick for FDA commissioner. We've already seen Senator Joe Manchin come out in opposition against him, citing his significant ties to the pharmaceutical industry, as Senator Manchin put it. Is the White House confident that Dr. Califf can get confirmed as FDA commissioner? Uh, we are, uh, and I will say that uh, the president chose Dr. Califf, and this was in his statement, but let me reiterate some of this, because he's one of the most experienced clinical trialists in the country, has the experience and expertise to lead the Food and Drug Administration during a critical time in our nation's fight to put an end to the coronavirus pandemic. I'd also note that how we see this, or how this president sees this nomination, is a continuation of what he views as excellent work under the leadership of acting FDA Commissioner Dr. Janet Woodcock, who's led the agency through a challenging time uh, because of what's happening in the world and, of course, fighting the pandemic. I would note that um, four years ago, five years ago, sorry, my math was a little off there, um, he was confirmed uh, by a vote of 89 to 4. Um, one of those four uh, is the individual you mentioned, and every senator can vote for or against uh, members or uh, people who are nominated. Uh, that's their role, but uh, we feel he's a qualified uh, person who has the exact experience for this moment. Thank you. And how many Republicans should we expect to see at the signing ceremony here on Monday? We will see. We have invited a broad group of Republicans, um, some in Congress, uh, governors, mayors, individuals who played a role in uh, helping move the infrastructure bill forward. And uh, as we get close to Monday or on Monday, we'll provide you, of course, a list of attendees. Have any Republicans, like Senator Mitch McConnell, said they, they will not be at that signing ceremony? I think he's spoken to this publicly, um, so I'll point you to that. But uh, certainly we have the invite out to a range of members where uh, we would, the president looks forward to uh, thanking them for their work, uh, for working together to get this done for the American people. Any the, confirm though? Last question on the um, President Xi meeting on Monday. Will the President hold a press conference afterward like he did following his meeting with President Putin? And does he plan to bring up the COVID-19 origins with President Xi, given he has said that China has been blocking investigators from getting access to information that's critical to that? That is a remaining concern, and there will be a broad range of topics that will be discussed, and the President certainly not going to hold back on areas where he has concern. Again, I would point you to the fact that we'll do this preview call on Sunday where they'll talk in more detail. It's uh, Monday evening, uh, so I would not expect a press conference that later after the call, given the time difference. But any time next week to hear the president talk I about I think there is one planned for after the, um, the, uh, the, by the meetings with the Mexican and Canadian uh, leaders next week. Uh, go ahead. Um, I'll come back to you. I'm sorry. Uh, you just said that the real risk uh, on inflation is in action, but uh, so far this week we haven't seen any action from the administration on gas prices. The president uh, in Europe said, you know, we would see action sooner rather than later on Wednesday that it was his top priority. So is he going to tap the SPR, ease biofuel blending requirements, uh, ban crude exports? And if the answer is you still haven't kind of decided on the, any of this, what is the message to Americans headed into Thanksgiving where everybody will be driving to see their family and friends that you think the current prices are acceptable? We certainly don't think that. Uh, the message to Americans is that 
Uh, we're not just closely and directly monitoring the situation, which of course we've been doing, but we're looking at every tool in our arsenal. You mentioned some of them. Uh, well, I don't have anything to preview today. Uh, the President is quite focused on this, as is the economic team. And I would note again that we have uh, taken a range of actions. We've communicated with the FTC to crack down on illegal pricing, are engaging with countries and entities abroad like OPEC on increasing supply. Uh, and we're looking at a range of options uh, we have at our disposal, but I don't have anything uh, here to preview for you. Axios reported that the president is considering uh, appointing an infrastructure czar to oversee that program. Would that be somebody that comes in from outside the White House or, uh, or the administration, or would we expect you know, the transportation secretary or somebody like that to, to sort of hold this position? Um, he does have an intent. He does intend to uh, to name a uh, infrastructure coordinator um, and someone who could oversee the implementation of the bill. Um, I don't have anything to uh, preview yet on that personnel announcement. I expect we'll have something soon, and you can expect it'll be someone from outside of the administration. And then the last one, um, Senator Manchin was critical uh, of sort of inflation this week. Obviously, there's a question of if it'll impact his vote on the build back better uh, issue, and I'm wondering if you've received any assurances from him that it, it will not. Uh, but also, uh, it plays into sort of a larger critique that he's had um, about the Fed having at some point ramped down. Uh, he wishes that they had ramped down bond buying and quantitative easing. So I'm wondering if that is a criticism that the White House agrees with, especially as the President's sort of evaluating this position. But, I'm just not going to get into critiquing the Federal Reserve from here or their decisions, given uh, they make independent decisions. I would note that, and I'll let Senator Manchin, of course, uh, speak for himself uh, and his uh, support or concerns he may have. Uh, uh, you know, what we're focused on is uh, getting this bill passed through the House next week, and we have every intention of working with leadership to get exactly uh, to get that done. And we will remain at a senior staff level um, at this point, engage closely with Senator Manchin, answer any questions he has. I will note that uh, most out, the vast majority of outside economists uh, agree that uh, this is not a bill uh, that will uh, add to inflationary pressure, and in fact, uh, over the longer term, it will ease uh, inflationary pressure. And, and I would note just a couple of people who at times haven't always been uh, been positive uh, about our proposals. Former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers said about Build Back Better, I don't think that's an inflation problem. He said uh, if he was in Congress, he would vote for it. Uh, Moody's Analytics Chief Economist Mark Zandi, I don't think the Build Back Better agenda will be inflationary. I think it's designed to lift long-term economic growth by improving productivity. That's public infrastructure, roads, bridges, broadband. That will make us more product pro productive. This, that should ease inflation. As we know, increased economic productivity and growth eases inflationary pressure. And of course, our favorite, the 17 winners of the Nobel Prize in Economics, who wrote that because this agenda invests in long-term economic capacity and will enhance the ability of more Americans to participate, it will ease longer-term inflationary pressure. I would also note, and then I will keep cooking around here, but that one of the reasons they don't have concerns, as they've said in many of these interviews that I was just pulling out components of, is because it's fully paid for. Uh, and the reason it's fully paid for is because we're asking corporations, the wealthiest Americans, to pay more in taxes. That is something. I don't, you don't need to be kind of a sleuth here to understand why some Republicans are speaking out against this package. Is it because they're opposed to lowering child care costs? Is it because they're opposed to uh, making sure that uh, preschool is available for families? Is it because they're opposed to lowering health care costs? No, it's because they don't want to raise taxes on corporations. We all know that. Hope people ask them those questions. Go ahead. So can I ask you about COVID very quickly? And sure. welcome back, by the way. Thank you. Um, the Colorado governor uh, just signed an executive order making everyone 18 and older eligible for a booster shot, which defies guidance from the FDA and from the CDC, which says that it sh the booster shot should only go to those who are at higher risk or seniors. What does the White House make of that decision and move? Well, uh, we here in the federal government are guided by science and our country's public health officials who are constantly reviewing the data uh, and to make their own independent evidence-based decisions. As you noted, uh, this isn't currently the guidance that's being uh, projected by our health and medical experts because uh, they are looking at and understanding the data. So uh, we would certainly continue to advise leaders across the country to abide by public health guidelines coming from the federal government. Um, if I can quickly just to detail your own experience, do you have any lingering symptoms? Have you had anything that stuck with you? 
I do not, fortunately. Um, and as I noted earlier, I was experienced a little bit of late fatigue in the first couple of days, but uh, none that prevented me from uh, pr participating in meetings here, engaging with the president and the team on the road, and certainly uh, probably calling members of my team so many times they were tired of hearing from me. As it relates to the White House, has the White House determined whether it is safe to hold holiday parties, and will the White House do so this year? Uh, you know, it's going to look a little bit different, uh, Peter, and I don't have anything to outline for you at this point in time, but certainly we uh, expect to celebrate the holiday season, um, and we'll have more details, I expect, in the coming weeks on so, that. So, for clarity, when you say it's going to look different, that means there will be holiday parties and they will look different, but you're not going to detail how they'll look different. Uh, we'll have more to convey to all of you about what it will look like, um, and I just don't have those details at this point Let me in ask time. One last question, if I can, quickly. Across this country, we've seen this new phenomenon lately chanted at sporting events and on signs. The phrase is let's go Brandon, a sort of code for a profane slogan attacking President Biden. What does the president make of that? I don't think he spends much time focused on it or thinking about it. The president said when he came into office on Inauguration Day, he said he was going to help get rid of the uncivil war in this country. So I guess through that lens right now, does the president think there are things that he can do differently, or how does he react to the stuff he sees out there when it is one of his primary promises or desires to help bring Americans together? Well, it takes two to move towards a more civil engagement discourse in this country, and the president's going to continue to operate. Uh, as you said, uh, from the promise he made early on, which is that he wants to govern for all Americans. He's going to deliver for all Americans, as is evidenced by the infrastructure bill that he's going to sign uh, on Monday. That's going to help expand broadca broadband to everyone, no matter your political party, no matter whether you voted for him or not. That's going to replace lead, uh, lead pipes, make sure kids have clean drinking water, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or not political at all. That's how he's going to govern, and certainly we're hopeful we'll have uh, partners to to uh, move toward more civil discourse with in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, Democrats are calling for the president to release barrels from the Strategic Petroleum uh, Reserve to bring down costs, and that would be somewhat of an immediate action to mitigate these high gas prices, as opposed to waiting for the um, BIF money to be implemented to address the long-term supply chain issues or the Build Back Better to be passed. Uh, why has the president not yet done that? Does he plan to do that soon? I don't have anything to preview for you. I, I can just reiterate what I conveyed a little bit earlier, is that uh, certainly the cost of gas uh, is uh, on, the minds of the, on the mind of the president, as it is on the mind of many Americans across the country. Uh, and there are several steps we've taken, including uh, pushing the FTC or asking the FTC to look into price gouging, something we've seen and we have concerns has been an issue over the past few months as the availability and supply, supply of oil has gone up and prices has not, have not come down, pushing OPEC to release more supply, to and meet the demand, and certainly there are a range of other domestic options, but I just don't have anything to preview at this point in time. Can I get your response to this report from the uh, Tax Policy Center that uh, under the Build Back Better plan, most millionaires would get a tax cut. Uh, Two-thirds of people making over a million dollars would get a cut on average of $16,800, <laughs> mostly because of salt. Uh, separately, it finds that 20 to 30 percent of middle class households would pay more in taxes. Granted, it's a small amount, between $100 and $230, depending on income levels. But how does the White House frame this reconciliation plan as a tax cut for the middle class paid for by the rich when this analysis is showing the opposite? It actually doesn't, just to give a little bit more context of what the report showed. It also showed that the average family with children making uh, $75,000 to $100,000 uh, per year will get an income tax cut of about $2,230. It also showed the average, uh, it, show, it showed the average taxpayer with income above $1 million per year will see their income taxes go up by $65,000. 75% of the tax cuts go to families making less than $200,000 per year, with 54 million uh, families making less less than $200,000 a year getting a tax cut. What we also don't buy into, which is part of your second part of this, is that any tax that dares touch big corporations, many of whom are making record profits and not paying any taxes at all, is somehow a tax on the middle class. Most economists agree with us. Build Back Better will clearly lower taxes, lower costs, raise wages, and economic growth, increase economic growth for the middle class. The strategy, and just look at the 2017 tax cuts. That was argued at the time that giving tax cuts to big corporations would trickle down to uh, lower income people. It didn't. None of that happened. Uh, so we're just not buying into that notion. But doesn't that not take effect, that cut that you're referencing, until 2023? So I guess what I'm getting at is 
next year, 2022, expectation is that middle class families will be paying, granted, a little bit more, but still a little bit more if this passes. And then also, they're still dealing with issues like gas prices being high. You guys have talked about the actions you're going to take or are looking at, but these are long-term solutions, mostly, that, that you're talking about. So what will be done in the immediate future to address the next year? Actually, many of them are short-term. But what, what is true and is not often out there is that a lot of these pandemic relief programs are ending, right? Are ending. So if you look at the spending, I don't really have a graph right now. I'm kind of making a fake one. But if you look at the spending from pandemic relief, that is going to go down because a lot of those programs are ending. So when people are out there, this isn't your question, but it just made me think of it. Uh, when, when people are out there criticizing the influx of money into the economy, that's actually misleading and inaccurate. What we're really talking about here is we're ending those programs. The president supports that. There are programs, to your point, like the child tax credit, that if we don't extend the child tax credit, 40 million Americans will no longer get the benefit of the child tax credit. That's an immediate benefit that would be happening next year. I mentioned before. Uh, investing in housing and building lower income or uh, available housing that uh, allows for options for lower income and middle income families. That is something that will have an impact. Cutting childcare costs in half, that's something that will happen next year. That, those are all ways that we're working, we are trying to and focused on lowering costs for Americans that would be a part of this bill. I want to ask you about real, uh, real quick about Ukraine. Uh, I know you discussed earlier the Russian troops amassing on the Ukrainian border, uh, field hospitals, as we all know, sort of being set up in April, indicating that there might be some action there. Blinken's comments uh, about concern about Russia rehashing the 2014 invasion, and then Jake Sullivan underscoring the commitment uh, to Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity. Mm -hmm. But has it doesn't seem there's been any indication of more support on the way from the U.S. right now uh, to the Ukrainians. To the and then, so why is that? And then also, why did we send the CIA director to Russia instead of the Secretary of Defense or our ambassador or Blinken to handle this kind of a diplomacy issue? Like, who is he speaking for in that trip? He's speaking for the U.S. government. I'd also note that the CIA director is also the former ambassador to Russia and the former deputy secretary of state. So he does come to it uh, with quite a bit of experience. But the president looks at his national security team as a group of smart, engaged individuals who are representing his national interests overseas. And that's what he's doing. I will note on the Ukraine question, Part of the reason I mentioned the engagement with European allies and partners is because, as you know, we operate in lockstep with our allies and partners. Uh, that's how we've approached things. We are we have a shared concern about reports of military buildup on the border. I don't have anything to preview at this point in time, but that is something that we are very actively engaged with, not just the Russians on and the Ukrainians, but also our European partners as well. I just want to skip around because I know we're not getting to enough people in the back, so I hear. Um, okay, let's go all the way. The time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jen. I had a question about the meeting between Xi Jinping and President Biden on Monday. Um, the U.S. Holocaust Museum this week came out with a report that China's actions towards the minority population of Uyghurs in the country may amount to genocide, uh, its use of, of forced slave labor and forced sterilizations and other actions. Is that something that the president is going to bring up with Xi Jinping? And is, is that something that the president will hold up as uh, something that Xi Jinping needs to take action on to reverse before the U.S. Uh, uh, gets closer in its relationship with China? Well, I would say that one of the purposes of this leader-to-leader -leader engagement is to also discuss areas where you have strong concern and disagreement. And you know, it's not just the president's words, though. We've also acted. Uh, we are engaged, first of all, with members of Congress and uh, on technical advising, providing technical assistance on legislation that's currently working its way through Congress. But in addition to that, we've also taken concrete measures on our own, including visa restrictions, global Magnitsky and financial sanctions, export controls, import restrictions, the release of a business advisory, and rallying the G7 to commit to take action to ensure all global supply chains are free from the use of forced labor. So this is an area where we have been, the president has been vocal, he has taken action. Again, in terms of topics that will be discussed, there will be areas where we work together, and he will not hold back, as he never has, on areas where we have concern. But I will leave it to the preview call on Sunday to give you more uh, detail. Just on that. Does the president believe that his personal relationship with Xi Jinping, going back to having a meal together in a noodle shop in Beijing in 2011, and their, their, the times they spent together, will that have an impact on his ability to um, 
engage with Xi Jinping and get China to take actions that it's been reluctant to take so far? I would say that you've heard him talk about this before, Brian, and he feels that the history of their relationship, having spent time with him, allows him to be uh, quite candid, as he has been in the past, and he will continue to be as we look ahead to next week. Just to okay, follow let's up go on the all China. the way in the back. Right. There you go. Uh, on the Monday virtual meet, uh, will will concerns on uh, the border tensions with India also be raised uh, between the two leaders? Again, I know there's a lot of interest in this meeting. I certainly understand it. We're going to be previewing it later this weekend. There'll be a range of topics discussed, uh, you know, uh, some where we have concern, uh, some where we have areas where we can work together, some certainly security-related, economic. There'll be a range of topics, but I'll leave it to the Sunday preview call. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. I wanted to ask about the numbers that came out this morning about the record number of people quitting their jobs in September. Is there a concern that this number might go even higher when the vaccine mandate goes into place? And what is the administration doing to help companies who are concerned about retaining workers once the, the mandate kicks in? You're, you're talking about because of the vaccine mandate right. being implemented, and is it specific companies? I just haven't seen this data, so give me a little bit more information. So there's some companies that are concerned once the vaccine mandate goes into place that they may have trouble retain, retaining workers, especially hourly workers who may not want to get the vaccine. Um, are you afraid that these uh, numbers of people putting their jobs will go up, and what is the administration doing to help companies who are worried about this? Well, first I'll say that hasn't actually <laughs> been what we've seen at the vast majority of companies who have implemented vaccine mandates. And as you know, the deadline hasn't come up for where it would be required. It's coming up in the coming months. But many companies, uh, the airlines, of course, hospital systems, have implemented vaccine requirements. The vast majority of people have participated in them uh, and abided by those requirements. And now they have a healthier, safer, more predictable workforce. So we haven't actually seen that to date. So I don't know that we would have that to predict in the future. Also, companies that are worried about losing their workers are probably waiting to implement a vaccine mandate, right? So I, I would see if companies convey that, we can speak to that. But obviously, we're working uh, to uh, implement uh, the OSHA requirements, the, the regulations that were put out just last week. And our view is that, and a the view of a lot of outside economists and experts, too, is that this will require more certainty for companies and that they will know their workplace is safe, that people will feel safe going to their workplace, which has been an issue throughout the pandemic, and that they will also know that workers are less likely to get sick from COVID, which has been uh, you know, in a range of industries, uh, an enormous issue and created a great deal of unpredictability across the board. Go ahead. Jen, uh, I'll come back to you. With the Transgender Day Remembrance fast approaching, 2021 is the has the highest number of uh, recorded uh, deaths of transgender and non-binary people, pulling out at 45 this year, according to the uh, Human Rights Campaign. Uh, the president uh, brought attention to this issue as a candidate, but has he been briefed on it as uh, in the White House? I'm not sure, Chris, and I'm happy to ask uh, the president and see with our domestic policy team if they have briefed them on that. Um, that's devastating, and uh, that's terrible heartbreaking to hear. Um, it is a commitment of the president to address violence, address threats uh, to transgender people um, and anyone who's facing those threats. But I will see if he has been briefed on that. What options are on the table for him to pursue on this issue? In terms of reducing violence, let me just see if he's been briefed and I'll talk to our domestic policy team and maybe we can connect you directly with them to get more information. Go ahead, Weisha. Thanks, Jen. So that report that um, my colleague was citing yeah. was not directly just about people quitting because of COVID mandate. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's helpful. But the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that in September alone, 4.4 million people quit yeah. their jobs after 4.3 million in August. So how are those figures accounted for when the president talks about the record 5.6 million jobs created in the first nine months, when he talks about job growth, economic growth, et cetera? Well, what you also see in the data, Weijia, I'm not sure this data, but other data, is that people feel, the vast majority of the American public, even when there, as there are concerns about costs of household goods uh, and other child care costs, et cetera, that this is a good time to change careers and look for a new job. Uh, so we're also seeing that, and I think that's likely reflected in that data as well. And we've seen that uh, happen psychologically during the pandemic, and also because people uh, you know, may have taken the moment to decide what they wanted to do with their lives. So in terms of, we have still created that number of jobs. There are people who are changing jobs. Um, I can check with our, I'm not sure what your question is though. Are you asking how many of the new jobs created are people changing jobs or? So I'm asking 
And, you know, in two months alone, some nine million people quit their jobs. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that they're all going to new jobs. So is there any concern about this trend? You have the great resignation. Is there anything you can do to reverse it? Well, we know we've seen labor shortages in some industries. In some industries, that's because they need to have a more competitive package to offer to workers. It's a worker's market right now. We know that. People are looking for more dependable benefits. They're looking for uh, wages that are higher. Uh, and that's something that is incumbent on a lot of industries to meet the moment on. But uh, I can certainly dig more into this data and see if there's more to provide. And then just a quick question on the infrastructure bill, because in Baltimore, the president talked about how it will ease congestion at yeah. ports. Um, but those projects are going to take time. So when do you think that funding will actually have a direct impact on the bottlenecks we're seeing now? And in the meantime, is there anything more the administration can do ahead of the holiday season? Well, one of the steps we took, there's no question that addressing um, being able to ensure that goods are moving uh, around the country uh, more, more safely, more easily, without congestion, is a big objective of this uh, infrastructure bill the president will sign on Monday, and it will help hopefully address that over the long term. As we know, the supply chain issues are global, and we're seeing them, uh, you know, countries around the world impacted by the global supply chain issues. So, but what he's doing here, and what he's been quite focused on, is uh, really attacking the issue at ports and the congestion at ports, which we know is a big is a big way that goods are coming in and where goods are moved. So. We announced, uh, I think it was last week or earlier this week, it's all running together, that uh, within 45 days we'll be launching $240 million in grants to improve ports. And in the weeks and months that follow, billions of dollars of additional money will be flowing to improve our critical port infrastructure. We've also seen uh, big dramatic improvements at a number of these ports, where they are quite crowded because the increase in uh, demand and in goods that are moving has increased by about 20 percent. But because of the steps that have been taken in terms terms of moving uh, empty containers, in terms of putting uh, putting uh, in place um, you know, uh, requirements or consequences for congestion, that that has dramatically. We've already seen improvements in that. So the president announced this major ports plan. We're going to get these this funding out. He's really focusing on the areas where we have the largest amount of traffic that's coming into the country, which certainly makes sense. And that's a part of what we can do more immediately. Thanks, Jen. Go ahead. Following up on we just first question about workforce imbalances, you, you said that it's a workers' market and that some industries need to create more competitive packages. That it's, that it's a good thing, people have more choices. Is that your way of saying that the White House doesn't view this as a problem at all? I think I also said in response to Weasel's question that there are some industries where we're seeing labor shortages. There are a couple of reasons for that. But some of the people, the workers, and we've seen this statistically and on a lot of surveys, people, many people across the country feel this is a good time to change jobs, right? To look for a more competitive job. What I'm saying is ultimately that's a good thing. It is challenging in certain right. industries when they do have labor shortages. Some industries, in terms of some short-term indu uh, industries that have um, short-term workers or seasonal workers, COVID is an issue there and continuing to address COVID. In our view, putting in place requirements to provide more certainty, that's an issue. Another issue is childcare, something we're working to attack and go after uh, aggressively so that we can lower the cost of childcare and make sure people have a range of options to bring more women into the workforce. So there's a range of issues. I'm not saying it's one thing. Uh, certainly, uh, we uh, have concern about any industry that has a shortage of workers, but also, uh, I don't think we should undervalue the fact that many workers feel this is a time to look for a better job with greater pay and more benefits. And then following up on the questions about gas prices again, just kind of taking a step back, there's some Republicans who have taken this moment where they've seen gas prices spike to criticize sort of the administration big picture, right? Canceling the Keystone Pipeline, halting leases for you know, new drilling leases on federal land, saying that sort of the administration's policies writ large have contributed to the rise in gas prices. What's your response now to that? Uh, our response is that uh, one, we haven't ex we haven't canceled existing uh, the ex their existing leases that are continuing. A just to be clear, I know so you know not that new leases. not new leases, but just to be clear, and I know that's been a criticism, so that's why I said that, not an accurate one. 
Look, our view is that the rise in gas prices over the long term makes an even stronger case for doubling down our investment and our focus on clean energy options so that we are not relying on uh, the fluctuations and OPEC and their willingness to put more supply and meet the demand in the market. That's our view. Uh, we feel that, uh, but we also feel that there are a number of actors here, including price gouging, that we have concerns and we've seen out there. We feel we've seen. We've asked the FTC to look into the need for OPEC to release more. That are the larger issues here, and that's why we've been focused on those options. Yeah. Uh, let me just keep going around. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks. I, it's following up on this, and I kind of want to go at this inflation question a sure. little bit differently. I mean, I, it seems like the White House is making a lot of promises on inflation, but there are some concerns that the White House or a president doesn't have a lot of power over inflation. And even when you talk about energy prices in particular, like gasoline, you're talking about the FTC doing investigations. That's a common tactic. It usually doesn't turn up very much. Tapping the SPR, that's a short-term thing. It's not a long-term thing. So I, I guess my question is, it, for the White House, you're making these promises. How do you deliver, especially on things on like gasoline, food prices? Yes, you can you know deal with childcare costs, but these kind of bread and butter issues. How do you actually deliver on that? Well, the. Some of the biggest costs, the reason I touched on those is some of the biggest costs for households and Americans and the way they feel inflation is not typically looking at a graph, right? They're looking at the costs and how things are impacting them are things like housing and childcare and health care. Correct. Big but those are big, big costs on people's households. And that's why I addressed and raised those issues. I'd also note that every outside uh, economist, most a vast majority, I guess I should say, predicts that inflation will come down uh, next year. Uh, that is what outside experts are predicting. So what we're really talking about is how we cut costs in the short term. I've outlined a number of ways we would cut costs. I would note that we don't have partnership from with from most Republicans on that. We hear a lot of screaming about inflation. We don't hear a lot of solution agreement or willingness to participate in a solution. And that's really, or discussion of a solution, and that's really what we're looking for at this point in time. So I noted that the way that we can and how outside economists are projecting we can address inflationary issues is by pa continuing to push this agenda forward, past the agenda, because it will help spur economic growth, it will help spur ec pro productivity, and also because it's fully paid for. And that's why outside economists, Larry Summers, Moody's, Mark Zandi, don't think it will have an, a negative inflationary impact. Uh, on, on a separate issue, on November 16th, there are about 200 uh, acting positions in the federal government that will kind of lose their authority under the Federal Vacancies Act. Um, look, what is the White House planning to do about that? Um, you know, is, is there any, are there plans in place about those acting positions, acting roles? We'd certainly love to get more people confirmed, as you know. Um, I will check and see if there's anything we can outline further for you. Yeah, just a quick uh, follow up on Dr. Kalis. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, so when Senator Manchin released a statement yesterday, he talked about his ties to the pharmaceutical industry and then subsequently the industry's role in the opioid pandemic or epidemic. So I'm wondering if the White House is concerned that this could be a tough vote for Democrats who come from states where the opioid, opioid epidemic is severe, such as New Hampshire and Nevada. Well, I would say that, one, the president has been very clear on his view on the role of the pharmaceutical industry in the opioid uh, epidemic. He has also been an advocate for lowering the cost of prescription drugs by allowing Medicare to negotiate prescription drug costs, something we know the pharmaceutical industry does not support. So I think the, the president is hardly in the pocket of the pharmaceutical industry. I think they would, they would agree with that component. That is true of the vast, vast majority of Democrats out there as well. And what the president, is, well, the reason he no nominated Dr. Califf is because he feels he is qualified, he has the experience, he's ready to take on this job the day he's confirmed. Uh, and that's probably why the reason why he was uh, supported and passed uh, with overwhelming support of Democrats and Republicans just five years ago. Okay, can I ask you a question on Ethiopia? Sure. Thank you and welcome back. And thank you. Miss you the most. Uh, and thank you for taking question across the behind you. And, uh, oh, it's our re it's our our, re our regional reporter. We'll get to him in a second. Go ahead. Thank you for taking question across the room. Maybe the the, the other thing is if we can limit follow up question to two, that would be great for everyone to have an opportunity. <laughs> Ethiopia seems to be on the brink of a civil war. The U.S. State Department is urging America to leave the country, and even providing loan for those who cannot afford 
to depart to, to leave Ethiopia now. The US, the AU, the UN are urging Ethiopian leaders to, um, to embrace peace. But we do not seem to be near any peace at the moment. What is there anything else the White House can do uh, to avoid uh, a to avoid uh, another Afghanistan like exit? Well, I would first say, and you, you may or may not have seen this, but this morning the Treasury and State Departments announced the designation of six targets associated with the Eritrean government in response to the growing humanitarian and human rights crisis and expanding military conflict in Ethiopia pursuant to the President's executive order in September. And I know you've been asking when we would take some action pursuant to that executive order, and so we took some action this morning. Um, I would also note that um, uh, we are briefly delaying plans to roll out sanctions targeting elements aligned with the TPLF and Ethiopian military to allow time and space to see if these AU-led talks uh, can make progress. If they do not seize the opportunity and the parties continue escalating the war, we will move forward with these sanctions. But we are currently leaving space for these uh, talks to continue. Just one follow-up, and then I got to go to him, and then there's a cabinet meeting. Go ahead. On the President birthday on Saturday, mm -hmm. is there anything that we've been doing? He's 79 years old. How does he keep fit? <laughs> we see him cycling. Does he do anything else? He certainly does enjoy a good ride on his bike uh, and does keep fit, uh, eats healthy, except for the occasional ice cream. Who among us doesn't love ice cream? Um, and again, as someone asked earlier, um, you know, the president will be receiving a physical uh, at some point soon, and we will release those Before details to you. Uh, uh, yes, and we will release those details to you as soon as that happens. All right. Uh, hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have here Rick Barrett from the Milwaukee Journey, Journal Sentinel. Oh, I don't know if we can hear you very well. Maybe we can fix some audio issues. Uh, let's see if we can fix the audio issues because I just have to go in a minute. Uh, let's try again. Can you? Can we want to try talking again? We can see if we can hear you. Oh no. Jeff, can I ask you All right, one? he's going to come back next Friday. Okay, last one. Thank you, Jeff. I wanted to ask you a quick follow-up. You mentioned a second ago that the White House was offering technical assistance to members of Congress when it comes to human rights legislation. Um, what technical, what provisions were you talking about specifically? Well, I was I was answering a question. I don't remember who asked it. Uh, that was at, oh, it was Brian, right? Uh, who asked about. Um, our concern about human rights abuses um, in Xinjiang, something we have taken a lot of steps on. As you know, and I think you've asked about, there is legislation. It's pretty common for the White House to work with Congress uh, on either technical assistance or other assistance. We want to make sure any bill is implementable. Yeah, a provision that would have banned um, science funding for entities that were implicated in the Uyghur genocide was stripped out of the reconciliation package last week. Is that something that the president was disappointed to see? I, I don't have any other reaction. Obviously, we're working closely with Congress. We share the concern about the human rights abuses. We are going to continue to take action as the president's record shows. Okay, thanks, everyone. Regarding the vaccine, do you have anything to say to celebrities who have promoted, like Aaron Rodgers, who promoted alternative, dubious alternatives to vaccines? You know how we feel about misinformation. We're against it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.